I have a very intimate relationship with death. So I, I understand it very well. So when I'm making decisions on what I want to do for my life, as far as what I eat, uh, as far as how that affects my health, okay, I may choose, to, I'm choosing to eat meat, despite what a lot of the medical community says is, you know, probably a bad thing. I am taking that risk on knowingly, right, if there is a risk at all. And I know that if, if I were to die of a heart attack sooner than later, I'm okay with that. Because right now I'm not depressed. I have motivation. My life is significantly better now. And I would rather have that than another potential three, four, five years of life. Okay, good morning, everybody. We've got uh, Eric with us today, aka Nurse Eric there, or Regenarian, I believe is what it goes by. Anyway. All right. Yeah. yeah. Well, welcome. First of all, thanks for taking the time to do that. Where are you, where, Eric, where are you located at? Uh, Dr. Becker, thanks for having me on this uh, podcast. Very honored. I'm, I'm from Phoenix, Arizona right now uh, is where I live. Grew up in the Chicagoland area. So, Okay. I grew yeah. up in Chicago too. Interesting. Yeah, I, I lived in South Chicago in Chicago Heights when I was a little, oh, little yeah. kiddo. So I'm familiar with it. I got a lot of relatives up in there. And I like your background. I see the, the uh, kale hunters are there, you know. <laughs> Yeah, they notice they're not hunting vegetables. So you're in uh, what part of the, are you, you said Arizona in Phoenix or what part are you in? I'm in Phoenix. Yeah, I'm in the big city. Um, I live kind of central. If anyone's familiar with Phoenix, there's a, a number of mountains that are kind of uh, landmarks. So I'm north of Piestua Peak and I work at a level one trauma center as a nurse, um, as an RN um, in an uh, area uh, called Sunny Slope. Okay. I lived in, I lived in a surprise when I was stationed at Luke Air Force Base out there. I worked and I, I worked a few of the banner hospitals when I was there. So I'm sure you're oh, right on. pretty, pretty big chain out there of hospitals. So, well, well, just kind of tell us about, I mean, you're a nurse. Well, tell us about your background. I mean, uh, obviously there's more to it than that. So why don't you go ahead and share that with us if you don't mind. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm one of these people who's open to trying new things. Uh, I'm also, as a father, as a person who's um, moving along with time, uh, my body has uh, made some changes since my youth. And uh, so, you know, I've always been interested in how can I, how can I change the trajectory of my health uh, using lifestyle? So um, uh, I've always been interested in how can I eat differently? And how can that have an effect on my life? Uh, so I've been, I've tried a lot of different things. I've, I've tried um, plant-based diets um, for long periods of time. I have uh, gone now to uh, hyper carnivore. So I mostly eat uh, grass-fed, grass-finished uh, ribeyes and ground beef and um, lamb and, and, and that kind of stuff. So I've, I've, I've experienced a lot. Um, you know, I, I take a pragmatic approach to how I decide what's important to me in, in that, in, in what I mean by that is I'm more interested in my N equals one than I am in a lot of the, uh, you know, speculation based on uh, research epidemiology. Is this going to work for me? It's a, it, did it work for you? Did it work for a population? Um, I kind of take things uh, one day at a time with my own experience. And I try and utilize the best that science and medicine has to offer to give me a good idea of what not to do. Um, but ultimately, it kind of comes down to how I feel. And after experimenting with a number of different ways of eating, I've now currently been um, on the carnivore diet since August 9th of uh, 2021. And I have no, um, uh, I, I don't see myself changing uh, my diet at all in the near or far future um, because of the, uh, the the level of the benefits that I've received from this have been incredible. And and there's no there's nothing there's no foods that I've tried to add back that have improved my life except coffee. Um, I took coffee out. I brought coffee back, and uh, that's the only thing so far that uh, from a. Um, from the plant kingdom that I've found offers any benefit. And 
and you know, so uh, that's a little synopsis of, of where I've been. Um, I, I had a large uh, Facebook uh, uh, support group for people who are doing intermittent fasting. It grew up to about uh, fourteen thousand members. Um, uh, you know, so I've I've gone the intermittent fasting route. I've done extended fasting. I've done ice baths. I've done a lot of things to try and you know maximize the 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 appreciable benefits of lifestyle um and i've just landed here uh so that, that's why uh, it's really such an honor to be able to speak with you uh, dr baker because um i've been following you for a long time and and uh, i appreciate the wisdom and the sanity that you bring to to the carnivore community so a lot of people think i'm insane so it's kind of interesting that's uh... <laughs> Um, well, you know, it's interesting because you say, well, I don't, I don't care about, uh, you know, this study or that study and, it, but, but something influences you to make that decision. You know, you, you look at mm. some sort of thing that, that influences us, us all to decide to do something. And, you know, very often it's, it could be, uh, some dude on the internet said, Hey, try this. I mean, we got people that are doing, you know, I mean, this is right now we got a bunch of people munching on testicles, which I think is hilarious. I mean, <laughs> uh, I mean, it's just, uh, you know, whether it's beneficial or not, besides the point. But I mean, it's, you know, there's something that influences different people uh, to do different things. And and so as a, as a nurse, a trauma nurse, I mean, you've seen some, a lot of heart attacks. I'm, I, well, heart attacks aren't trauma, but I mean, you're, you're going to get the heart attacks through there, I'm sure. Um, do you, I mean, I mean, I, I guess this is something that, that, you know, it's like, I keep hearing that, uh, well, the, the, the hospitals are full of people eating meat. <laughs> well, 90, 98% of the people eat meat. So, I mean, it, there's got to be something that distinguishes why well, I'm not in the hospital uh, getting my chest cut open and someone else is. I mean, are you seeing anything right. that's, that's common from just practical experience, which I think is very valuable, by the way? I mean, what do you see in there? Yeah, from my perspective, and, and I would say the, the most interesting part of my career was working in the ICU. Um, so, I've I've had... A lot of experience in, in different levels of care. Um, what I see is the sickest people happen to also seem to correlate, at least from my perspective, with um, metabolic syndrome. So whether it's um, the people who had uh, succumbed to uh, COVID acute respiratory distress syndrome, um, when I was working in the ICU, there was definitely a commonality with uh, those uh, um, uh, with that demographic of patients, and so uh, I think that was some. That's something that I can't ignore. Um, you know, when I see uh, you know those obvious characteristics um, uh, and having an effect on on people's lives. Um, so yeah, the the heart attacks. Um, yeah, the kidney stones, the from from every facet. I kind of run a, a little narrative in my mind. Uh, it, it's like a, uh, I want to make it into a comic book series someday. Plants versus humans, basically. Uh, you know, people don't come into. Uh, I mean, there are motor vehicle accidents all the time, uh, but the majority of them, uh, a lot of them, have to do with drunk driving, uh, impaired driving, for some reason or another. And, and we don't uh, derive uh, alcoholic substances from, from animals, right? Uh, the diverticulitis, diverticulosis, the um, ulcerative colitis, you know, I don't believe that that's, these people aren't coming in eating strictly, you know, meat. And in fact, from what I've seen from my own experience is that when you eliminate all the plants here, my digestion got a lot better. Um, which is contrary to what the research would have us believe. Um, and so the way I come to this conclusion is, so let's say fiber, for instance, there's a lot of randomized controlled trials that show increasing fiber intake decreases uh, constipation. Well, I've eliminated fiber from my diet and I've eliminated constipation altogether, except for when I have too much cheese and then I know to take a little magnesium to fix that. Um, but in general, if I'm just sticking to muscle meats and organs, um, then I don't have that problem. So where I'm going with that is um, that it seems to be that there is a problem if you're looking at kind of uh, um, like 
uh, risk um, or hazard ratios, right? You shouldn't see a hazard ratio that looks like it does for me, because what I'm saying is I'm zero fiber. I have no constipation. But if you're only eating a little bit of fiber, you could be constipated. But then the more fiber you eat, the less constipated you get. That's a weird hazard ratio curve. But my own experience tells me that I don't care about that hazard ratio curve, what it looks like or what they're trying to say that it should look like. To me, I have no constipation when I'm uh, doing this. Uh, so, and and I, sorry if I've, I've gone off track, but, um, you know, as far as looking at plants playing a role in the hospital, you know, type two diabetes all day long, you know, these people are, you know, eating carbohydrates. It's a non-essential nutrient. You can live, you know, your life and have a great, uh, happy, healthy life without any carbohydrates. And yet uh, we continue to take that plant derived product and say, you need to keep eating this for some reason. Yeah, I mean, it's to, uh, be healthy. Yeah, just, just a couple of comments, you know, the fiber thing, and I know it's controversial and I, I still, well, I'm, it's clear it's non-essential or, or many of us would already yeah. be dead by now. You can't say it's an essential nutrient. There's a lot of people that will say it's, it's, it's beneficial. Most of the data seems to, most association data seems it's, it's beneficial. There's experimental data that shows it's beneficial. And again, it's usually yeah. almost relative to people that are eating kind of a, a low quality diet. And so I think it's just, you know, removing yeah. kind of garbage from there. And uh, I mean, there's, I think there's evidence that would show that uh, it is not, unconditionally beneficial in all situations and I, and I would posit that maybe a carnivore diet is one for many people not all but many um the the diabetes thing you know the carbs you know people the critics of that say well i mean yeah you can have a lot of people eat carbs and do fine they don't have diabetes and i think that's you can't just ignore that uh but at the same time uh i think the way we i think the way we treat diabetes is abysmal quite honestly you know like i said here just hit somebody with insulin and then chase that with orange juice and, and some pancakes, you know, six hours later or whatever. I mean, it just, it doesn't seem to make sense. Um, mm -hmm. Do you, I mean, obviously in the ER, you're on the acute side of things. So prevention is not really what the ER is designed to do and probably don't get much chance to interact with that. How do the, how do the colleagues around you act when you're in there eating your friggin' steak and whatever for, for on your lunch break or however it works. I mean, you're getting any kind of weird, what the hell are you doing type of things? Don't you know that stuff's going to We have a good time with it. They all yeah. know that I'm completely committed to eating this way. Um, I'm always open for conversation. If people want to have a question uh, about, you know, what are my concerns? Am I worried about heart disease? Um, you know, they always ask about um, digestion. Um, I try and keep it light and, you know, uh, and, and this is one of the ways where well, when I say I, I appreciate you bringing sanity to the community is you don't make absolute statements. And that's what I appreciate. You don't say this is for everyone. And and that's the way I talk about it when I'm in the emergency department and the doctors and nurses and techs and you know phlebotomists. And they're all like asking me, why do you eat this way? Well, because it's working for me. It's working for me. That's the one thing that I can say beyond the shadow of a doubt. Nobody can take that away from me. How do you, how do you know it's working for you? Define that. So the biggest thing for me, and I explain this on my social media, is, is that uh, the depression that I didn't realize I had eating the way that I was eating is gone. And, and I know there, and I've, and I've kind of looked, you know, uh, at, at why maybe like why did my depression go away and it's and I had been on antidepressants before so I know how well an antidepressant can work when you're depressed so being on the carnivore diet has uh, I would say at least a magnitude times two better than uh, the, the, the antidepressants I had been on so I know it's working because in the amount of time that I started, I, I committed to it. I stayed with it. Obviously, I've had little, should I try this? Should I try that? But the over, overwhelming sense that I've had is that um, I see my day differently when I wake up. When I wake up, it's easier to wake up. I wake up and I'm not groggy for a half an hour. I have five minutes of wake up time where I'm kind of like shake it off. Um and then, you know, after a few months, I started to get this started to get this feeling like I need to have a resistance training uh, regimen. I've never done that. 
and, and, and I've always looked at exercise as a necessary evil, but for some reason, I now have the motivation. I now have the, the positive outlook and I'm, and I'm so much more interested in taking care of myself. And that's never happened. When I tried a, um, a diet that was uh, trying to mimic like an Ayurvedic style plant-based diet. So I was eating a lot of actually, if anyone's uh, here uh, is familiar with Indian cuisine, kitchidi. I was making kitchidi, like pots of kitchidi. Okay. And it's uh, basically rice and lentils. I would use whole grains and all that kind of stuff. Um, all organic herbs and seasonings. And, and I would add a little bit of meat. I wasn't completely, um, you know, eliminating um, animal products at the time, but I was using it sparingly, like the recommendations say. I didn't have that experience on that. I didn't have that experience when I was trying raw fruitarian. I didn't have that experience when I was trying um, intermittent fasting, right? So now it's since my whole perspective on life has changed, uh, I can only attribute that to the way that I'm eating. I don't have the digestive issues that make me feel horrible. Um, and I don't have the joint pain that I used to have. I don't like all those things. They're all coming together and pointing towards this way of eating has done that for me. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, it does. And I just because you know some people so how do you know you're better and, and and again it's hard to to say definitively i mean what 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 is the definition of health and i think for every every person it's unique i mean what's maybe important to me like I, you know this morning I was, i'm running a 400 meter sprint around my yard you know my my driveway and it's up a big hill there's a couple of hills and so it's not, not it's it's harder than a real 400 because it's got yeah, that's awesome. but i but i'm just like if I'm faster, I'm getting better. I mean, to me, that's that that's part of how I define health. I know it sounds goofy, but that that's part of how I define it. But uh, a lot of people will say that you know, just because your joints don't hurt and your digestion's better and you don't have depression and you lost weight and you got leaner and you're getting stronger, that doesn't mean you're healthy because you could die of you know. It, it's it, it basically it becomes a very nonsensical argument in my view, and so I, I just I just try to get people to understand that, you know, none of us are going to know or are going to be able to predict the future with any real, real level of certainty. And the, I think, you know, if we focus on, again, the ER is a place where uh, you're slapping band-aids on people, obviously, you know, drug, oh, yeah. drug band-aids and, you know, it, it hurts my soul. <laughs> I mean, but I mean, I want to help them so much on a lifestyle level. Right. But I mean, you know, at least in that situation, you are taking care of an acute illness and, and taking them out of danger and maybe, Maybe it's not the ultimate solution, but at least there. But I mean, when we look at the way we treat chronic issues, we, we don't even do that. I mean, we're, we're not even making them better. We're arguably decreasing their quality of life, I think, over the long term with the side effects and the medications. And, the, you know, they're just you're just kind of maintaining disease rather than discussing getting rid of it. Do you uh, have a lot of uh, I mean, is there, is, is there a lot of dissension from, you know, like you said, people uh, kind of talk about it and laugh are there people that think you're crazy and think you're harming yourself or physicians that are sort of bought into the low fat plant-based uh you know bring cholesterol down to the lowest possible at all possible opportunities yeah yeah i've had some conversations with some people and talking about uh you know cholesterol and, and heart disease and all that and um i you know there's still a few steps behind on um, what the actual consensus is even in the scientific community as far as uh, dietary cholesterol having uh, an effect on uh, on that. Um, well, I mean, I, I, I just let this interrupt because when you say consensus, you know, I mean, there I don't know if there is an actual consensus, but I mean, if you look at organizations like American Heart Association, which some people refer to as the authority, their their consensus position is still that you know decreasing LDL cholesterol is important, and so I think again consensus yeah. is, a, is a dangerous term in my view but i think there is okay. significant evidence that would point to perhaps that is not maybe the best advice for all people and, and there's significant information that would say that uh you know maybe uh maybe there's some other things to look at like like uh, i think diabetes how, how often do you see people with heart attacks that are diabetic or pre-diabetic is that is that pretty common for you for heart attacks if they're diabetic or pre-diabetic yeah. yeah i think that's the 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 group of people who's most at risk for having a uh, heart attack. 
Um, I mean, is that what you right. is that what you see on the ground though? Because I mean, that's what the data I think seems to suggest for things like the women's health. Initiative. Oh yeah. yeah, when people come in, when we have STEMIs and STEMIs, uh, when when they're coming in with chest pain, whether it's um, stable angina or or unstable, whatever it is, um, I mean, just just looking at into the room, you know, it, it seems like it's it's typically people who are, um, uh, you know, they're they would have a uh, their BMI would be would be pretty high in a non-muscular, you know, high BMI. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 so obese, uh, perhaps diabetic. And for the for the people that are at STEMI, if you can clarify that ST elevated MI, or can you talk about the difference between the two of those? Um, yeah. So, and STEMI is kind of a, or uh, yeah, STEMI is a is a ST elevation myocardial infarction. So this is a heart attack that has occluded a large vessel. So much so that uh, you can see changes in the electrical activity in the heart. So we can put on an EKG and they can see that the, the, the typical heart wave goes like this, but a certain section of it is elevated. And that means that there is a lack of blood flow to the heart at that point. And, and, and that typically happens when you have a clot uh, that forms on a ruptured plaque. And uh, so... Yeah, when, when when these people come in, you know, there's certain things that I pay attention to, obviously, uh, body shape and size, but also behaviors, because a lot of times I, I've had people come in, even with heart failure uh, from from some sort of uh, heart event. And, you know, they're asking their their loved one to you know, go, go pick up, uh, you know, some fast food burger and fries. You know, it's like they don't get the, you know, they they eat a certain way. And it's and it's not you know um, it's not high quality meat. It's not you know it's not it's also not the people eating you know higher quality you know you know plant based foods. I, there it's fast food. It's convenience foods. It's um, yeah. yeah. I mean the convenience. Uh, I think the convenience foods conveniently make you die earlier. But apparently, you know it's. I mean, life is too challenging. Why don't you just be dead? I'm just kidding. But um, do you find, how long have you been a nurse, Eric? I've been doing this for eight quite years. A, eight years. Eight years. I was an electrician before I became a nurse. I decided to do this because um, uh, my uh, the, the part of me that cares so much, you know, yeah. couldn't interact with being an electrician. Pipe and Wire didn't care that I cared. But uh, since becoming a nurse, I've demonstrated that my uh, empathy and compassion have been a, a massive um a benefit to to my community I've, I've won the uh the daisy award for uh exceptional nurses these are people you know nurses who go above and beyond and you know caring for their patients it's not a technical thing it's more of like i moved somebody's uh heart to be able to to, to, to nominate me and i've been nominated so many times so that's 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 my shtick you know that's kind of my thing um and, and and most people know that if if people come in, they're hard to deal with. I get those patients, and if people come in and it's like the end of life stuff, you know, uh, I am great at helping people transition uh, their family member from life to death. That's kind of where I, where, you know, um, where I shine. The reason why I bring that up, uh, you know, to answer your question is that um, I have a very intimate relationship with death. So I, I understand it very well. So when I'm making decisions on what I want to do for my life, as far as what I eat, uh, as far as how that affects my health, okay, I may choose, to, I'm choosing to eat meat, despite what a lot of the medical community says is, you know, probably a bad thing. I am taking that risk on knowingly, right, if there is a risk at all. And I know that if if I were to die of a heart attack sooner than later, I'm okay with that because right now I'm not depressed. I have motivation. My life is significantly better now. And I would rather have that than another potential three, four, five years of life. Yeah. But, but, and, but let me finish this because this is, this is the important part. But I've started a resistance training uh, routine. Okay, that's got to increase my my life my life expectancy because I'm decreasing sar sarcopenia. I've stopped drinking alcohol since I've gone carnivore, something that I I couldn't shake for the last twenty years. 
Why? I don't know. I don't know what's in the meat that's making me <laughs> that made it so that I can finally feel good enough about my life that I'm I'm like willing to put alcohol aside. But having done that, I have to have increased my life expectancy. So um, anyways, uh, I yeah. bring up a lot of points all at the same time, but I, I'm sorry. I, we, no, I think those, those are great points. And I, and I often make, you know, make similar points in the fact that, you know, you if you look at all of the things that contribute to improved health or, or longevity. And again, longevity, I think it's, it's tough to make that argument, but just if from the improved health standpoint, you know, let's just assume that all the data that people say that red meat increases your risk of colorectal cancer by a, a relative risk of 1.7, you know, or 17% and, and LDL cholesterol increases your risk of, of a cardiovascular event by 38%. Uh, then you look at all the things you've lowered, you know, BMI, increasing body, body, you know, lean mass. If you look at removal of depression and all these other things, it's probably a wash or maybe even fall. It probably ends up ultimately in your favor. And so, and I think the, 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 the statement you make is I'm okay with that. Yeah. I mean, who, who's there, who is that that tells us what we get to die of? Do we, you know, I, I can only die. I can't die of heart disease, but you, you have to die of cancer or neurodegenerative disease. Who, who are the people that are telling you that, you, you, that that's what I, what anybody would want? I mean, you know, gosh, I mean, you know, I've obviously all of us would like to live to be 120 and drop dead of a heart attack and not suffer. Uh, you know, I don't, we, I don't think we get to pick any of those types of things, but that's, right. that's, uh, and maybe most people don't want to live. But I've also yeah. 100% increased my risk of feeling awesome. Right. So right. like, right. you know, <laughs> that's, so that's, I don't, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, it, I, I think that quality of life is one of the things that's one of the factors that's missing in research. Every time I look at any kind of research study, you know, even I, I, I have limited knowledge on this, uh, admittedly, but, you know, if you look at all the different major studies, nurses study, um, you know, uh, all the data that they, they put together, how often are people looking at how the different foods affect your quality of life? It seems like there's this, obsession with these end of life potentials like these potential things that could happen to you later in life i mean you could get hit by a bus you know you could get you could get a heart attack you could get a stroke but like why aren't they studying how good you can feel based on the different ways that we eat i don't understand why quality of life isn't included in in these conversations more than it is. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the NutriRex study from 2019 that was done by the, you know, that 14 international scientific group uh, with uh, Brad Johnson, I think being the lead author, and I think Gordon Gott was this one of the senior authors there. One of the things they did include was, was you know, um, patient choice, you know, and they talked about, you know, given people have preferences, they, they, like, they like eating meat, that that was part of their their calculus is to say there's no reason to give up meat based on the data there's no strong evidence that causes heart disease cancer really anything else and let people eat what they want to eat because and i think that's a fair statement i do think that's important to do that because uh if you told me i had to eat bug burgers or soy burgers you know four times a week to save the planet i'm not going to be a happy human you know i'm not i don't, don't, don't want to be on the planet quite honestly right you know yeah. so i mean it's it's one of those things where yeah i think it is an important aspect and hopefully uh well I, I think, you know, we, we all have to make that decision on what uh, what makes us uh, do our best and be our best. And I think that's, you know, and, 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 you know, some people would say, I like eating ice cream all day. I like cake and ice cream. It makes me feel good. I'm happy and I'm morbidly obese and leave me alone. And I think that's fine, too. I mean, you, you should, that's your decision and you can live with the consequences. I'm not going to tell you. I might say, hey, I think it's a bad idea, but I'm not going to say you can't do this or you shouldn't be allowed mm -hmm. to do that or you should be taxed if you do that. Uh, um Although, I mean, you know, you could look at, and this is a thing, you know, a lot, this goes back because you mentioned a little bit about COVID and stuff like that. And a lot of people were saying that, you know, your decision whether or not to, you know, uh, take a vaccine or not is impacting the healthcare system. And at the same time, I, I you know, spent many, many a nights trying to get a bed for a person with a broken hip when the hospital was full because it was overrun with obese people that were having acute, you know, acute whatever, you know, yeah. kidney failure or respiratory failure. And, you know, because they, they wouldn't take care of their lifestyle. So this lifestyle stuff, it does impact everybody else. And so your decision to treat your body like a trash can does have a effect beyond just yourself when it comes to healthcare resources. I mean, I had, it was kind of an interesting, I, it, it's not totally related to that, but when I was in Afghanistan, we had the situation where we had a, we had a uh, guy come in from one of the forward operating bases and was talking about resources and they're very limited. 
And so the special ops guys would bring him in. They, they, you know, they get in battle, they bring in enemy combatants, uh, and you know they were injured, and he'd have to take care of them because that's what you do as a physician. You don't you don't make a judgment call. You don't you know you're a bad person, therefore you don't get health care. But what he said was, you know, every time you bring these people in here, we run out of resources, and we're not going to have enough for maybe the good guys type thing. So they didn't. He didn't have that problem anymore. They just they basically just got the mess and they just killed them all. Which I mean is you know it's kind of a crazy. Yeah, this right. is this is to the to the extreme on this, but this is war and yeah, that's extreme so, triage right there, right? right. right it's extreme triage. You, yeah, we're, we don't have resources. So we're just gonna kill you instead of capturing you alive. But but we, you know, we we all we have sort of that ethical dilemma a little bit to some respect, some extent. Did you see during? I mean, because you were working as a nurse during the COVID time. Any were you seeing all these young, healthy people, fit people that were in shape dropping dead of COVID, or what, what was your experience? I've asked a lot of people. There this. was. There was one guy. Um, I wasn't there for it, uh, but I, I trust my colleagues. They don't make stuff up. Um, he was, in my understanding, 23, mm -hmm. um, body of a Greek god, you know, abs. Is, something happened with him. He had he had COVID and he died. I, I don't, I wasn't there for the autopsy, obviously, so I don't know um, if it was COVID or if it was something else, but he did have COVID at the time. But no, um, I would say that, you know, most of the people who were um, on the ventilator, in a rotoprone bed, um, doing all these different things that we were doing to try and save their lives, were um, uh, either a lot of them were uh, were morbidly obese. Um, a lot of them were from the 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 Indian reservations. That was really sad to see because yeah. you know they they don't have the hospital, uh, um, um, they don't have the, the the means to take care of people in those conditions uh, up there in the hospitals they have so they always come down to the city um and then and, and then it was older folks too there were a lot of older folks and so it seemed like the demographic was um you know metabolic syndrome and age yeah. that really had uh, the biggest impact yeah that's surprising at all to anybody do you know um let me ask you a question. So you're working, you know, obviously right now you said ICU <laughs> half time, your patients are in a base. You can't really have much of a conversation with them, but uh, do you get to talk to people, your, the patients you interact with about dying life? So is that discouraged? Are you allowed to, or are they saying, Hey, you can't talk about this stuff at work or how does that go? Um, no, I don't think anybody, well, the way that I talk about it is always um, within my scope of practice. So uh, I can have casual conversations with people about, I ask, I ask this question. I ask questions a lot. Hey, you have type two diabetes. Has, has a doctor or a nurse or, or a diabetes educator ever asked, ever told you whether or not your disease is reversible. And out of hundreds of times I've had three, three people say, yes, I've been told this is reversible. You know, how come you haven't done anything about it yet? Oh, that's hard. Okay. Well, that's fine. You know, you didn't get, you know, you didn't get the right education. You didn't, you didn't have the right options uh, given to you. Uh, so I ask stuff like that all the time. You know, people come in with the, the digestive issues. What do you eat? You know, uh, what, what's your diet like? Well, I eat a lot of fast food or even if it's not a lot of fast food and you know, nobody coming in with digestive issues like that um, is on the carnivore diet. And that's probably just based on statistics, but yeah, I talk about it a lot and I tell people, you know, I'm not saying that you should do this, but this is the way I eat. I don't have any digestive issues. You know, it's, it's one of the, it's one option in the realm of possibilities that may work for you. And, and, you know, I just want you to like, consider it, you know, maybe find somebody who knows what they're talking about in this. I obviously can't help you with this. I'm just your nurse today. I'm going to discharge you. You're going to go home. You got to figure it out on your own. But I do encourage people to think for themselves. And I think that's within my scope of practice. And, um, I have great conversations with people, great conversations with, with patients who they, they've, they've never thought about some of the lifestyle ways that they can uh, take control of their health. So, yeah. And, and let me ask, cause you regenerian, re, regenerian, is that what, that's what the hand regenerian, is? regenerian. Yeah. Where does that come from? Is that regenerative agriculture? Where does that come from? Yeah, that's um, actually, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have even tried uh, the carnivore diet. Cause I told my, when I had started in August, the plan was just to do it for a month, kind of, kind of do a Joe Rogan thing, you know, do just see what it was like for a month. Right. And, um, I, <laughs> um, I'm very into agriculture. I, I, I raise chickens and ducks. Um, I've been 
planting fruit trees in my backyard. I had a plan to do this, a little section where I would have actually like some lentils growing, <laughs> you know, like I was trying to feed myself doing a little bit of, you know, loosely related to the kind of homesteading, but trying to be a little more self-sufficient. And the more I started reading about regenerative agriculture and the potentials of regenerative agriculture, I've read um, Gabe Brown's book, From Dirt to Soil, um, very interested in uh, the Rodale Interest Institute's uh, work, um, White Oak Pastures. I've read all the papers on, on White Oak Pastures and the work they've done. And despite the criticisms, what I see is uh, an incredible potential to benefit uh, both the environment and, and human health. So regenerian kind of means we're regenerating, uh, we're re regenerating soil, we're regenerating the environment, and we're regenerating human health. So that's what that kind of means to me. And I, I kind of want to move forward on, on my socials with that brand because I, I think it, it, it's a holistic uh, view of, um, of health. It incorporates the environment and it incorporates your own health and, and, and obviously uh, eating um, high quality ruminant meat is, is part of that. Are you, uh, I guess, chickens and ducks, are you duck eggs, chicken eggs? Is that part of your diet, I assume? Yeah, yeah. We, I raise them for the eggs. And uh, the, the farmer, my, my farmer's name is Mark. Uh, he goes to a farmer's market right outside of like my walking distance from my house. So every Saturday is, uh, you know, my routine is go have a nice conversation with, uh, with Mark and uh, pick out my ribeyes for the week. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Uh, and he's practicing regenerative agriculture too. He's he's a Mennonite farmer. Um, a lot of the Mennonite farmers who came up from Mexico have experience in farming in arid lands. And there's there's a lot of land that's being used for agriculture now that was pure desert back in the day. Because uh, but but with this low, uh, it's a low tech um, um, method, you know, of just grazing ruminants on the uh, you know grazing your ruminants on the land uh they poop you know they bring in the bugs you know they that sequesters more carbon and nitrogen from the bugs that are going to come in and break down that poop it's going to fertilize the soil they're going to trample um the the brush and and the, and the grasses that trampling helps push the carbon and nitrogen into the soil it creates good balance um and it can it can basically terraform it's uh it's a you know Regenerative agriculture is an extension of agro agro agroecology, and uh, and you can bet that people like Elon Musk are looking into these you know technologies to if we're going to ever colonize Mars. Okay, uh, you're going to have to have some way of creating soil out of almost nothing. You know, basically it comes from the atmosphere. You know, but ultimately it comes from the atmosphere when the um, when the autotrophs take you know, carbon and nitrogen out of the atmosphere and, and put it into the into their own materials uh, that goes into the roots, all that kind of stuff. But um, I think that's the way to move forward uh, rather than trying to move to a, a purely plant-based diet, because I, I think that if we were to do that and completely remove meat from the diet, um, our healthcare system would be overwhelmed with, with illness. Um, so I, I think we need to stay focused on what's more ancestrally appropriate in, in my opinion anyway yeah my, my i would share that that sentiment for large i'm not so excited about going to mars quite honestly i, I don't know that <laughs> well i mean well, I, it's not an option for me i mean i'm i'm far i, too I just that. use that as, yeah. as a no, an example it. of i like, get it the what technology. is the practical application of regenerative agriculture and it's right. taking land that is unusable and turning it into usable uh you know pasture land yeah i just i just have the concerns i think about with mars and i don't know that a fetus can develop without without the, the right gravity so i mean you might have to oh, have yeah, artificial yeah. gravity that mimics earth perfectly in order to to be able to, to grow a fetus but uh you know interesting because I, I don't think you can change mars's gravity i mean you could you might, you might be able to terraform and change the climate but you're the gravity you're kind of you're kind of limited to due to its size and and therefore um you know unless you're living under domes and gravity uh you know simulated gravity all the time you can never have a pregnancy i think i don't know it seems interesting to see if that will ever happen but um I think we have enough problems to solve on earth right now, which, no, uh, sure. which are, which are interesting. And one of them is, has to do with food and feeding everybody. And I think meat is a, is a really important part of that. So, 
Um, where, um, you know, as far as, you know, I'm, I asked you how long you're doing healthcare. So eight years is not that long relative to see change, but how often do you see uh, mental health playing a role? Cause you mentioned you had depression and it's now better. How often do you mm -hmm. see people with mental health disorders? Is it common? Do you see a lot of that in the ER? A lot, a yeah. lot, a lot. Yeah. And it's, uh, mental health issues can be a real burden on, on the emergency, uh, medical environment because, these people need a lot more attention, especially people who come in with suicidal ideation. Um, it takes it takes staff out of uh, out of the count to to monitor that person. Um, but also, I see a lot of homelessness. So when people are coming in homeless, there's either substance abuse or mental health issues. Um, one of the stories that that I think is, is really interesting. I had this, this man, he was homeless, very nice gentleman. Um, you could tell he's seen better days, but, uh, when he finally got to the point where the doctor said, Oh yeah, you can have food. I bring him the menu. And I said, Hey, and I do this with most of my patients. Uh, if you should try the steak, right. Cause we have, we actually have a, a, a tiny little overcooked ribeye on our, <laughs> on our menu. And, uh, but, Say, hey, you, you know, just try the steak, man. You know, you're going to feel better. This guy, his eyes lit up like, when was the last time I've had a steak? You know, and, and, and this guy has been living on the street. So you know that the kind of food he's been eating has been garbage. You know, he hasn't had a steak in decades. And his face just lit up. He gets his food. I come back to check on him. Hey, how was the steak? And you could just tell, like, he, like he experienced... A, like a, a feeling of like connecting with his youth and better health and better situation. And I could see it was almost giving him hope. Like, wow, maybe, I, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe I can feel better. Maybe I don't have to feel like garbage my whole life. You know, maybe I can feel better. I'm like, Hey man, you know, you're going to be here for a few days. So you can get the, you can get that steak breakfast, lunch and dinner. You just ask. And, uh, that was a, that was a happy guy. That was a good moment, you know? That was a good way to connect my, you know, my, my, my beliefs with, with what that guy needed in that moment. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's awesome. And I, I can imagine, you know, uh, how, how good he must have felt, you know, with, with some high quality nutrition. Because often, you know, we, you know, we have these food shelters and it's always, you know, people just donate their, their leftover garbage. You know, it's like the processed food. And I mean, these people are thankful to get any calories they can. But at the same time, you know, I, I don't know that bad nutrition is sometimes it's maybe worse than no nutrition some in some cases um I, you know i know it's a controversial statement but uh it would be nice if we could uh you know because we you know it's 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 you know you think about like uh we've got farmers right now uh, you know the, the, we waste 40 percent of the food we produce in the united states all goes it's it's destroyed it's, it goes in the landfill it doesn't it doesn't get to no one eats it and then on top of that now we've got farmers being asked to, to plow under crops and pour out milk and all this stuff which is just a it's just a tragedy to think about the the nutrition we could provide for people even on the even on the animal agriculture side um do you uh let me ask you another another thing here with uh regard to you said so resistance training what what prompted that what was a what was the rationale between because you mentioned sarcopenia what was a mm. what what sort of turned you on to say hey i need to start getting stronger uh, it was just a, it was just a, I don't, I don't know how to describe it. Um, I, I feel like it came out of, I, I did some resistance training early on in my life before I had kids a little bit. It was like right after high school, I was working as an electrician I'd go to the gym. I remember feeling good. Um, the, the second most effective weight loss program I ever had was after I had a divorce. Uh, that just kind of, uh, that's a very typical a uh, way to uh, to get to get fit is after you've had uh, gone through an experience like that and you're and you're on the market again. Uh, somehow that that pushes people to want to get better and take care of themselves. So it just kind of was born out of feeling good. And I, when I when I was as I started to feel good, as I started to kind of just look at my life in a different way uh as i started to say you know what i just need to do things that that 
benefit my life, you know, self-care, that kind of stuff. I was like, I, I feel like I, I just want to go stress my muscles and feel what it feels like. And as I, and I, and I got the gym membership after I tried it for a month, for a week and it felt good. And I was like, this feels good. It just feels good to wake up in the morning, bring the kids to school, go to the gym, do upper body one day, do legs the next, whatever my training program is, it's, it's you know, going to get better as I go on, but it just feels good. It's like, it adds benefit to my life. Yeah. And, but there wasn't, there wasn't like a reason why I said, Oh, Oh, it wasn't intellectual. It wasn't like I should have bigger, um, you know, stronger muscles, you know, and reduced sarcopenia because I had been doing that on a plant-based uh, diet. Um, but like I said, I did that more out of a feeling of necessity. Like it was a necessary evil. Now I just enjoy it. I mean, you know, if I had the opportunity to go do something, uh, you know, hard, like I love hiking Camelback Mountain. I love hiking Piastawa Peak. It feels so good when I'm eating this way. It feels better than when I was eating any other way. That's all. That's the only way I can describe it is I feel so good when I do it because I'm eating this way. I think it's because I eat this way. Very well. I, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, that's the same feeling I have, and, and I think many others have noticed a significant improvement. Um, the plant-based, were they, what problems did you have on a plant-based diet, if, if any? Did you have any, any problems with that? Did I have any problems on plant-based? Yeah. Or what prompted me to, sorry. Yeah, I mean, were you, were you experiencing any negative, negative issues with plant-based diet relative to what you're doing now? The, the last time, because I was on plant-based for, I think, uh, nine months, I did have a little bit of meat. Like I said, it was more of a Mediterranean diet. Um, I, I would have uh, digestive irregularity. Um, and in fact, because I was using the Ayurvedic method, I was actually, uh, the, it actually encourages you to do um, a digestive cleanse once a month using um, castor oil. So it was like, it was like the people who invented the Ayurvedic diet knew that it wasn't really great for digestion. So you're going to have to cleanse yourself every once in a while. Uh, I did, that was a problem for me because after taking castor oil, you know, if, uh, oh, every, every month I would do it over that nine months, I started to have an aversion to it. Like if I, I can do it now, but if I were just to think about castor oil, I would start to get nauseous. I don't know what's in it, but it's got to be something toxic. I mean, that's obviously how it works. It flushes you out. Your body's saying, get this out of my, out of me, you know, and it, everything else goes with it. So that was a problem. Uh, taking my blood sugar and my ketone levels. I've been tracking my blood sugar and ketone for a long time and eating in that manner. I did not see any benefits to my fasting blood glucose levels. Um, it was hard to maintain. I like to maintain a, just a little bit of ketosis because I believe that's uh, how I, that's when I felt the best when there are some circulating ketones in my, um, in my system. I'm not focused on that, but I like to know, you know, what's going on so I can tweak it. So, um, acne, acne was always really bad. Uh, you know, as an adult, I've always kind of struggled with, with acne when I'm, uh, strict, you know, meat-based, I, I don't have any acne. It goes away. Um, and then I would say that the depression, um, must have at, in, at some level been due to, uh, being plant-based. I, I think there's a lot of, uh, you, you know, uh, I, I appeal to research every once in a while, but uh, B12 and different uh, amino acids uh, have been, uh, my understanding, associated with, or lack of them have been associated with depression. And so I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if eating that way led to um, those deficiencies, which, which, which could have interacted with uh, my mood, and my affect. Yeah, there's, I know there's a number of studies looking at why plant-based diets are associated with mental health issues, including depression, the carnitine, this possibly is one, but there's a whole bunch. Um, I am happy to say that since being on a carnivore diet, I've never been compelled or felt the need to do a cleanse, <laughs> you know, no, <laughs> no juice cleanses or fruit cleanses or anything, you know, I mean, it's kind, right. of, a, kind of a, kind of a funny thing. You know, these people are constantly doing detoxes and cleanses on these plant-based diets, which I think is kind of comical. Um, you know, I think livers and kidneys that we have are kind of, that's our, that's their function. So we don't need to add to that probably. Um, what is so, so just, just cause you mentioned hypercarnivore, which 
definition strictly on the, I guess, the legal definition of hypercarnivorous, 70% meat. Yeah, 70. Uh, and, and some people will add fruit and honey and dairy and other stuff to that, uh, which I think can be a very good diet for many people. But so what does your diet look like day to day now? Uh, so, yeah, when I say hypercarnivore, just so that I can kind of capture that I do from time to time, uh, you know, attempt to reintroduce uh, foods. Uh, but um, typically, like I said, I go, um, I go see market, the farmer's market. Um, he typically has, you know, ribeyes, porterhouses, uh, T-bones, um, New York strips. Uh, I, I prefer um, steaks that I can cook to medium rare. Um, I'll also get ground beef, ground lamb, um, my chicken eggs, my duck eggs. Uh, right now I have, uh, from one of the people at the farmer's market, I have some goose eggs, duck eggs, and chicken eggs. So I'll be, you know, I'm going to try, try goose eggs for the first time. Um, I'll use, uh, heavy cream in my coffee and, um, from time to time, I will try to, like I said, to add in back foods. Uh, I've attempted with, you know, potatoes and just keeping everything simple to keep the variables low. Um, I just take potatoes and salt, just like I do my steaks, just steak and salt. Um, you know, and, I, and when I added back potatoes, I would feel a little bit joint pain, lower back pain, elbow pain, uh, stuff that was consistent with how I felt normally uh, before I started carnivore. Um yeah, you know, for birthdays, you know, kids want me to have some cake. I'm not so dogmatic with this that, you know, I, I won't, uh, you know, uh, you know, partake. Um, so, you know, um, every once in a while, I like a little dark chocolate before, before I go to bed. Um, I was experimenting <laughs> after I stopped drinking alcohol. Uh, falling asleep was kind of a you know, a little tough because my nightcap was, you know, was uh, my way to get to, to sleep at night. So what I did is I bought some raw milk and raw kefir because my understanding is carbohydrates kind of interact with the same receptors that uh, hypocretin or orexin A. Um, and I don't know if it, that, I don't know if that's the difference, but I know that it makes me sleepy. So that was helping me sleep. But I've eliminated that now that I've got gone through that adjustment period. Um, but just from time to time, I'll have a little bit of cheese. But I would say most of the time, I'm about between 95 and 99% carnivore. But those times that I do add something back uh, just to try it, that's why I say hyper carnivore, just so that I, I don't like making statements where people can call me out and be like, yeah, but you had this. Uh, yeah, fine. I had that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I get it. And okay. I, 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 I've, I've said, I'm very much the same way. I mean, I eat yeah. 99% of the time, like that, steak and eggs. I'm having, I've got a two and a half pound ribeye waiting for me here in a little bit. I'm going to crush with about eight eggs. That'll be my yeah. main meal today. I might have some more eggs and some salmon later today. I think it's my plan for the day. And uh, mm -hmm. every once in a while, yeah, like I said, I have this birthday cake on my kid's birthday or, you know, odd piece of fruit here and there but that that represents probably less than one percent of my diet to be to be fair so and i do think it, it makes sense not to be ideologically and dogmatically uh you know married to something because you just get in trouble with that whenever you make generalities always this never that and i think you just have to realize that but okay well we are well we've already went through an hour well eric i appreciate it Tell folks where they can find out about regenerian, regenerianism. <laughs> I'm sorry, stumbling on how to say that. Uh, yeah. If you have social media, those types of things, uh, that would be great. Yeah. Um, well, we've, we've interacted on Twitter. On Twitter, I'm at regenerian. Yep. I've seen uh, that, I yeah. believe there's an underscore at the end because somebody had already taken regenerian. On TikTok, I'm at regenerian. On uh, YouTube, I still go by Nurse Eric. And I believe I have in my name uh, the, uh, I, oh, yeah, because I like to say namaste. <laughs> namaste, I like okay. it, yeah. So that's that's my one of my things. I like to say namaste. It's kind of like the the general well-being and sense of, of, of holistic wellness that I get from the carnivore diet. You know, that's why I say namaste. It's, it's just my acknowledgement that this is a, a wellness a wellness path like many others. Um and then, yeah, you know, if you can find those, you can find all the other ones. 
<laughs> so, and eventually I'll, I'll, I will make the blog, the regenerian as I, I'm, I'm building a, a discord server right now where I'm keeping all of the research organized on uh, regenerative agriculture, agro agroecology, human nutrition, um, epistemics, There's a lot of stuff that I'm interested in. So well, awesome. well, thanks for doing that. Thanks for being here. Keep up the good work and uh, stay strong and keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. Thanks everybody else for being here. We'll be back tomorrow with somebody else. I can't remember who <laughs> somebody. Anyway. All right, guys, take care. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Dr. Baker. Appreciate All right. you. All right. Bye bye, guys.